Good evening from Los Angeles. I'm Tavis Smiley. Tonight, a rare conversation with one of music's biggest superstars, Prince. The Grammy and Oscar winning icon has just released a unique three CD set and a new website called lotusflower.com. The critically acclaimed project features all new songs, including several from a talented young artist named Bria Valente. We'll get Prince's thoughts tonight on a number of subjects, including the state of the music industry and how the digital age is impacting everything from content to compensation. We're glad you've joined us. A conversation with Prince coming up right now. Pleased to welcome Prince back to this program. The iconic musician and producer has been one of music's most popular and prolific acts for three decades and was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, as we all know, back in 2004. His latest project is a unique collection of three CDs, Lotus Flower, Minneapolis Sound, and Elixir, which features a talented young singer named Bria Valente. You can get all of this at his new website, lotusflower.com. From the new project, here's some of the video for Crimson and Clover. Good to see you as always. Likewise. Yeah. Look at us on that camera. Yeah. <laughs> Do we look good? Looking sharp. I'm feeling new sideburns. Oh, yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's working, it's working. And that black and white is, is sharp. When, when you're for the book, the best selling book, mm -hmm. 21 Nights, mm -hmm. your photographer Randy was here. Randy St. Nicholas. Yeah. yeah, Randy was here. And I remember in that conversation, the two of us talking about the fact that you stay pretty much clean all the time. It's not like when you're in your house, you got on sweats and... Randy said that? Yeah, Randy said he's, Randy said he's pretty sharp all the time. Okay. Yeah. No. That, that's, that's, that's not true? Yeah, I sleep like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you know what? I, I, I would believe that except for the fact that I know that you don't sleep. Yeah. You really don't sleep very much. I saw a sign in the back that said, uh, uh, journalist, advocate, insomniac. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, for you, it should be the world's greatest musician, uh, insomniac. That's what it is. Props um, to you on your show, seriously. I, I watch every chance I get, and um, Hugh Massacala last night. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Joni Mitchell. Yeah. Man, it's just so enlightening. Well, I appreciate Inspiring. it. Inspiring. I'm glad you said that because I was actually, um, I never told you this story, but one day when you were on before, I was um, around town somewhere and we had promoted that you were coming on the next night. And I walked past a group of people <laughs> and they didn't see me obviously. And I overheard them talking about you and the fact you were gonna be on my show the next night. And one mm -hmm. of them said, why would Prince go on PBS? And I was thinking they don't know that Prince watches like everything but indeed watches PBS. Well I keep an eye on you because uh, um, you know you have been an advocate and uh, I learned a lot from State of the Black Union. I've, um, you've sent it to me and I've, uh, I make a point to try to check it out when I can and uh, uh, that said um, Dick Gregory mm -hmm. one time I saw him on there and it just moved me so much I put pen to paper and I, I owe him money now. Dreamer. Yeah. I want to talk about the song Dreamer that you dedicate to Dick. And actually four songs I want to get you to talk about the lyrics specifically. I'll get to that in just a second. Back to this PBS thing there right quick. I'll come back to that only because you really got into Unforgivable Blackness. Yeah. Um, What'd you make of that PBS series? Oh, I know. it's amazing. I, uh, I, I'm in sort of celebration mode mm -hmm. right now. I'm just thankful to be alive. I'm thankful to have the friends that I do and the teachers that I do and uh, I've spent the last year just playing when I feel like it and I really look forward to this time in my life mm -hmm. and I happen to come across that show Unforgivable Blackness and uh, the story of Jack Johnson just moved me to no end. One of the reasons is that he had to deal with seemingly insurmountable odds all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if he would knock somebody down, people from the audience would get into the ring and pick him back up, you know, <laughs> so they could continue fighting. Yeah. And um, I just related to it on a lot of different, in a lot of different ways. I was, um, I've never spoken about this before, but I was born epileptic. 
and uh, I used to have seizures when I was young and uh, my mother and father didn't know what to do or how to handle it but they did the best they could with what little they had mm -hmm. and uh, my mother told me one day I walked into her and said uh, mom I'm not going to be sick anymore and she said why and I said because an angel told me so now I don't remember saying it that's just what she told me and um, uh, from that point on I've been having to deal with a lot of things getting teased a lot in school and you know um, early in my career I tried to uh, compensate for that by being as flashy as I could and as noisy as I could and uh, you know I just looked again I look forward to this time in my life when I could reflect back on it and talk to people like yourself Dr. Cornell West I mean when you all come over to the house and we sit and we just talk about heavy things I um, uh, I'm, I just I just become thankful. I, I don't know what else to say other than that. How, how did you How did you get beyond because I know there you have so many fans of all ages and I think there are no doubt some young people watching who might who I know in fact not might will be helped by your answer to this question as a kid being teased so much and kids get teased for all variety of reasons as we know how did you grow out of that into not just into confidence but indeed into excellence, or maybe I'll put it in the wrong order, excellence and confidence, but how did you grow out of that? How, how, did, how, did, you, how did you navigate your, yourself past that? Uh, uh, good question. I have, uh, the first thing I did is I, of course I went into self and I um, taught myself music. Uh, my father left his piano at the house when he left and uh, I wasn't allowed to play it when he was there because I wasn't as good as him. Mm -hmm. So uh, when he left, I was determined to get as good as him. And uh, I taught myself how to play music and I just stuck with it and I did it all the time. And sooner or later, uh, people in the neighborhood heard about me and then they started to talk about me. And it wasn't in a teasing fashion, it was more like, wow, look what he can do. Mm -hmm. And there's something about um, having people around you giving you support that is, uh, it's motivating. And once I got that support from people, then I believed I could do anything. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a lot of really good teachers. Uh, my uh, best friend, Andre Simone, his brother, Eddie, uh, entirely indebted to in this regard. He used to tell me, man, you, your songs are better than anybody's on the radio. You can, you can do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just kept rolling with it, kept rolling with it. Eventually I went out to New York and uh, I got turned down my first time, but I just wasn't, you know, I felt like Jack Johnson then too. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't going to be put down, you know, so. Back to this excellence thing though, Talk to me ab about excellence. I mean, it's clear that you are head and shoulders above pretty much everybody else in, in the world of music. Uh, now, now, that's my assessment, and a whole lot of fans agree. We all say amen? Amen. amen. <laughs> See that? <laughs> so it's, it's pretty clear you're head and shoulders above everybody else. But, but talk to me about how we, who are not Prince, can aspire to the level of excellence that you portray in what we do every day. Well, everybody's talented at something. Right. Um, and that's what makes the world go around. We all need each other. And uh, again, it's about good mentoring and good teachers. I had a lot of good people around. The other thing I have to point out, though, is that um, um, how can I put this? My father was, he was so hard on me. He, he, I was never good enough. And there was something about that it was like, almost like the army when it came to music. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's not even close to, he'd say, it's not even close to what I'm doing. And he'd play again, and I could hear it. John Blackwell, my drummer, he's the uh, same way. His father taught him the same way. We learn like that. We learn from being shown. It's, it doesn't come from books and just reading it. We need to be shown, mm -hmm. you know? So it's just... Um, uh, having really good teachers and a bar that's so high, you know, Tiger Woods, I mean, 
I mean, we can go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Um, you talked a couple times about your father, which you don't do in public, and I, I appreciate your opening up in that way. Um, help me understand how, I'm trying to juxtapose knowing you as I do, everything about you is love. You, you, you create love in the space that you occupy when folk come into your world, they feel the love. Love is in your, your lyrical content. Your whole life is about a love of humanity. I'm trying to juxtapose how you got to this place of being love when you had this relationship with your father that obviously didn't always exhibit love. You could have been, you could be a very mean person now. Why, 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 why not? Well, I have a mean side. Yeah. Yeah. Let me back up the yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I can go there. Yeah. You know, I'm a fighter. I'm very competitive. I think from him being so hard on me that the one thing I got out of it is I understood that um, in, his, uh, in his harshness, he wanted me to excel. Mm -hmm. He used to say things like, um, don't ever get a girl pregnant. Don't ever get married. You know, don't uh, this, don't that. Uh, uh, when he'd say these things, um, I didn't know what to take from it. So I would create my own universe. Uh -huh. And uh, my sister's like that. My, um, a lot of my friends are like that, the ones that I still have, you know, early musicians and things like that. Creating your own universe is... Um, the key to it, I believe, uh -huh. you know, and and letting all the people that um, uh, that you need uh, occupy that universe. Uh -huh. To your friends um, that you referenced a moment ago, how have you chosen? How have you decided to maintain the friendships that you have maintained over the years? And what's your what's your barometer? for knowing whether or not those friendships are beneficial. Um, Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can tell whether they're beneficial if someone's respectful of you. Mm -hmm. You know, respectful of you when they're not around you. I find that uh, most people are pretty respectful in front of my face. Uh, when they're not around me, sometimes you hear them say some pretty hurtful things. and. I don't know if they think it won't get back to me or if I don't care or if I think I'm above it or whatever. But I remember them as I remember them. And we were in love then, we should be in love now. Uh, it, it's a hurtful place, the world in and of itself. We don't need to add to it. Mm -hmm. And we're in a place now where we all need one another. And it's going to get rougher. So um, I kind of. I kind of hope that, uh, I hope people, when they hear that, they don't think that I'm going to lash back out at them because I'm not like that. I don't, I've never done that. Um, I've heard a lot of things from a lot of different people, a lot of pretty famous people, a lot of journalists. Um, a lot of my work is judged based upon my personality or my past work as opposed to where we are now. Uh, and I am... Um, I don't know, I just, it is hurtful sometimes. How, how difficult is it to live in a world, in the earlier point, which I take, it's a brilliant point, the world is already mean enough, we don't have to add to it, but, but how, how, do, how do you contextualize emotionally having much of your work judged by your personality rather than on the merits of the work? Well, one reason is because I like criticism. I like constructive criticism mm -hmm. from smart people. Um, I'm thankful enough to, or blessed enough to be able to say that Miles Davis was a friend when he was alive. Mm -hmm. And he was a wonderful mentor and uh, really, really funny, you know. And he could uh, critique something you've done um, by humor. Mm -hmm. You know, and out of love, rather than just, you know, just call you a punk mm -hmm. and just say, you, you know, just dismiss you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, he, he wasn't like that, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, people he cared about, you know, he, he, he tried to help. Mm 
Um, when people criticize my work and attack my personality, it um, doesn't help me. I can't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they, you know, I don't know what they want. I, I, I've asked writers this before, and a lot of times they tell me that they just write for each other. They're not really writing for, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, yeah. I really got him that time, didn't I? Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, we don't, we, nobody learns anything yeah. from it. Really. Who, who, who's qualified? I mentioned, I want to connect these two things. I said earlier that you were head and shoulders above everybody else in the music world, uh, and most musicians, I think, even acknowledge that. Um, who's qualified? And, Maybe qualified is the wrong word, but it's the word I'm going to go with. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Who's qualified to critique your stuff these days? You mentioned Miles Davis. Oh, Miles, yeah. who's qualified to critique you? Oh, anybody. Music critics? It, Fans? It, other artists? Yeah, I don't mind critique. Anybody. If, yeah. if they do but, it with a sense of love, if they're trying to, you know, show me something about the work that, you know, they really feel is important for me to know. And I don't see a lot of that in journalism today. Uh, most journalists are just lazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like, but, but if you said you like being critiqued and you love constructive criticism from smart people, mm -hmm. how do people critique you if you are so ahead of your time as you have proven to be consistently? If you're so ahead of your time, how can they critique what they ain't even caught up to? Uh, because they, listen, if they don't feel what I'm doing, they're going to let me know. If it's somebody I love, they're going to tell me they don't feel it. And they'll right. tell me the reasons why. And I can appreciate that. You know, I, I write all the time. I record all the time. I want to go back to Jack Johnson because he's still in the back of my head. I can't get him out of my head where this conversation is concerned. Um, who have you felt most often like in the ring fighting the record industry? Like Jack or the opponent? Oh, like Jack. Like Jack? Yeah. Tell me why. Well, because I knew I was right. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about this in our very first interview and conversation together. Um, it, it's obvious now that artists are supposed to own their master recordings. I mean, in the future, it'll be unconscionable to even think you can take somebody's creation and claim ownership of it. See, unfortunately, this discussion is going to start to barrel into a discussion about the human genome and the DNA and all the rest of it. Um, when it gets there, then we're going to be in the deep water. Mm -hmm. See, so it's better to start the conversation now before we get into God talk, you know? Mm. Um, there are four songs that I want to ask you about, and I did what I have never done before, which is to actually print these lyrics out some of them, I'm, 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 since the record is so new, I'm learning some of them. I got, got some of them memorized. Um, who, it, who gave you the lyrics, though? I've seen some really strange rewrites of my yeah. stuff. Well, I've I'm, seen one time they uh, said uh, the lyrics to When Doves Cry was, uh, dig, if you will, the picture of me, Marvin Gaye, and the kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and know there, what? And then there was another one. <laughs> This person will go unnamed. Yes. Uh, she didn't speak the English language too good. Right. Uh, she had a really cute daughter, so that's why we was acquaintances. Yeah. <laughs> but she swore up and down, little red Corvette was pay the rent, collect. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> so you need to let me check that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, I'm a fast learner. So I'm not going to read none of these on the air. I'm just going to ask you about the songs okay. and about the lyrical content. And uh, for those who don't have the record, you can go to lotusflower.com and get it and, and follow along at home. Uh, even if you're two or three days late, you can play this back and follow along. In no particular order, since we mentioned Dreamer first, tell me about Dreamer. Oh, well, um, when I saw the uh, State of the Black Union, Dick Gregory uh, really moved me and a lot of my friends, I show it to everybody that comes over the house, especially white folks, because they need to hear that, you know, so that they know more about all of us. Mm -hmm. Because um, what he said affects all of us. He said something that really hit home about um, this phenomena of chemtrails. And, you know, when I was a kid, I used to see 
these trails in the sky all the time. And I said, oh, that's cool. A jet just went over. And then you started to see a whole bunch of them. And the next thing you know, everybody in your neighborhood was fighting and arguing, and you didn't know why. Okay? And, and you really didn't know why. I mean, everybody was fighting. So he, he started riffing about the chemtrails. And he started to say things that uh, hit home so hard. And I would recommend that everybody try to get what he said online or wherever and try to get a copy of it and just listen to it. Because the, uh, I was so moved that I had to write the song. The other thing is the first line of the song says I was born uh, on the same plantation in the United States of the red, white, and blue. And we live in a place now that feels just about like a plantation. We're all indentured servants, you know. Um, when I found out there were eight presidents before George Washington, I wanted to smack somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to know why I was taught otherwise. Just tell me the whole story. I'll fill in the blanks, but don't, you know, don't tell me something that you think I'm supposed to know. We're indentured servants and we got a black president now? Hmm. I don't vote. I have nothing to do with it. I got no dog in that race. And for those who would cuss me out and slap me in person if, they, if I didn't ask you why? Well, the reason why is because I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, we've never voted. And uh, that's not to say that I don't think uh, Barack Obama, President Obama, is a very smart individual and he seems like uh, he means well. Um, prophecy is what we all have to go by now. It's very interesting. I did a sold-out concert in uh, uh, London. We played 21 nights in a row and all the concerts were sold out. When I would watch television over there and you'd see the United Nations uh, feed, the direct feed from the United Nations, mm -hmm. you'd hear them talk a lot about religion. You'd hear the Bible mentioned constantly. This is not what we're used to in the United States. It's almost as though there's no need for God and no need for religion and um, justice in politics. So there's supposed to be a separation of church and state over here. Um, we can't have a separation of state and morality, though. And, you know, songs like Dreamer and uh, even Feel Good, it's, this, it's the same thing. Yeah. Let me, I got good news and bad news. <clears throat> the bad news first, since I like ended on good news. The bad news is I'm out of time for this show. Um, the good news is I think that if I lean on my friendship, I might be able to get Prince to stick around for like another 12 minutes. Uh, and if you tune into this program tomorrow night, we can finish our conversation. We, it's never over, but we'll continue it. Talking about these other three songs from the new CD, Lotus Flower, at lotusflower.com. You can get, I want to ask you about these other three songs tomorrow night and then this fine artist who he referenced earlier, you can take five anywhere you want to take it. This fine artist he, re he referenced earlier in this conversation, Bria Valente. Oh! Yes. <laughs> Bria will join us tomorrow night as well. So now tomorrow night, talking. Yeah, now we're talking. All right. So tomorrow Thanks. night, part two of our conversation with Prince and Bria Valente with us tomorrow night as well. She's one of the three CDs in this new Lotus Flower uh, package of three CDs. Prince, thank you for coming on. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's our show for tonight. Catch me on the weekends on PRI, Public Radio International. You can access our radio podcast through our website at pbs.org, and I'll see you back here next time on PBS. Until then, good night from LA. Thanks for watching, and as always, keep the faith. For more information on today's show, visit Tavis Smiley at pbs.org. Hi, I'm Tavis Smiley. Join me next time with part two of my exclusive conversation with Prince, plus Prince's latest protege, Bria Valente. That's next time. We'll see you then. Good evening from Los Angeles. I'm Tavis Smiley. First up tonight, part two of our exclusive conversation with iconic music superstar, Prince. This spring, he's out with a brand new collection of music, a three CD set called Lotus Flower. The discs are available at Prince's new website, lotusflower.com. Also tonight, the talented young singer featured on Prince's new project, Bria Valente, the Minneapolis native, kicks off Lotus Flower with a terrific CD called Elixir. We're glad you've joined us, Prince and Bria Valente, coming up right now.
Welcome back to night two of our conversation with my man, Prince. I'm still holding these papers from, from last night. I, I didn't even change clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Did it get not his Prince, but he looks good all the time anyway. Uh, when, we, when we last well, actually, left... Actually, I changed. This is this double of all the same stuff. <laughs> Tavis is one that didn't change. Yeah, though. yours is double. You got yeah, two of those. There you go. Well, you know, if it works for you, it works for me. I changed, too. I got two of these. <laughs> Um, when, we, when we left you last night, I had these papers in my hand. Uh, we were talking about some of the song lyrics uh, on his new CD, Lotus Flower. You, you know it's out. Uh, three CDs in this, uh, uh, in this package, Minneapolis Sound, uh, Elixir, and uh, Lotus Flower. So three, so three CDs in the package at lotusflower.com if you want to get it. Uh, we were talking last night to Prince about some of the lyrics, and we, we talked about Dreamer. I didn't get to these other three. Um, can I ask you about Colonized Mind? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, colonized mind uh, has to do with uh, the state of the union right now, mm -hmm. the state of uh, the union for all of us, not just black, not just white, but all of us. Um, yesterday we spoke a little bit about how I was raised, and my father, uh, he was a very strong individual who uh, demanded uh, a very high standard from me in everything. Mm -hmm. um, you said something that's very interesting is that I could have turned out a mean person. Uh, I do have that side of me, but what I try to do is I, to the best of my ability, funnel it back into the music. Um, Larry Graham is a dear friend of mine. I just want to say what's up to him and Tina and Aaron and Latia. I'll be home shortly. Um, I'm having a lot of fun out here though, so. Uh, <laughs> I. Uh, I just wanted to say something. Larry has got a volatile side to him, too. He told me a story once. I hope he, Larry, I got to tell this. I just got to tell it. <laughs> One time, Larry and Freddie from Slime and Family Stone mm -hmm. are on their way to a gig to open for Jimi Hendrix. Now, right then, I'm shaking, can't wait to hear what's about to go down. On the way to the gig, they pick up some of their amplifiers, and their car is loaded with these amplifiers, right? Um, it's hard to see, but they're driving, and they're late trying to get to the gig. They either hit this guy or a guy runs into them, but there's an accident, <laughs> right? In right. the middle of the street in New York. Larry jumps out the car, whoops this dude's backside. Yeah. Just <laughs> Let, Freddie's with him, you know, they both from Oakland, so you know what time it is, right? <laughs> I, I don't even want to see what that dude look like. Yeah. Okay. So, it's like he got that side to him, mm -hmm. right? And I just, I was just taken by that part of the story. But then I asked him, I said, so when you got to the gig, like, what happened? Who, who won the battle between you and Hendrix? And Larry said, oh, we spanked him. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, wait. You spanked Jimi Hendrix? Yeah. He said, "Can we spank?" I said, "It's Larry Graham, man." Yeah. You know. So it's like, same thing with him. If you listen to his music, you can hear the bass and the, the the funk, the the anger, mm -hmm. is in songs like "People" and "Water" and "It Ain't No Fun to Me" and stuff like that. You know. So. Um, that's, that's what I learned from, you know, that's my, that's my teacher. Mm. Yeah. Colonize mine. Two more I want to ask you about. Feel better, we referenced this last night on the show. Mm -hmm. Feel better, feel good, feel wonderful. I love the title, I love the song, but I love the title. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's about telling folks to celebrate and stop hating. Mm -hmm. um, there are references in the song, though, to a record executive who, uh, We've had some pretty interesting conversations. Um, and uh, there's a line that says, you tried to do me like my good brother Steve. All right. What we believe happens in the music industry is this, is that you can put out a record and SoundScan refuses to count as many as they actually sell. But you get paid on what SoundScan says that you sold. Mm -hmm. So if it's a loan number, then you only get paid on that number. Meanwhile, when you go overseas and you check some of the uh, barcodes and 
titles over there, they've already ripped you off several different times in several different ways. Also, with the, um, uh, the influx of the Internet, you know, no sales, then you've really gotten your uh, bank account emptied out. So we never really knew what Purple Rain sold. I don't know to this day. I only know what they tell me. You know, um, we're conducting an audit, but, you know, who knows? A whole bunch. Yeah. <laughs> well, we suspect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Old school company. Oh, oh, Minneapolis yeah. Sound. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's just an ode to how I grew up and what we used to listen to. And there's a few uh, current references in regards to bailouts given to, you know, banks and things like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, there's a lot of us, you know, in the hood still going through the same stuff. Now, um, it's interesting. I don't live there anymore, but I have to take care of a lot of people that live back there. And it just be best to, I hear a lot of talk about redistribution of the wealth and stuff like that. It just be best to let us try running things on our own for a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, give us our master tapes back. Let us um, sell uh, just like you sell. You know, if you go to the internet, you'll see uh, uh, artists with 51 million hits. You know, they say there's like 200 million people on MySpace. That's a nation, okay? Uh, I. I would shudder to look at their bank records, you know, with the music that goes through there. Depending on one's perspective, you are either a genius for doing stuff like this, mm -hmm. doing it yourself, distributing it yourself, um, et cetera, et cetera. You're either a genius or you are a hater of the industry, a hater of the way things have been done, ought to be done. Tell me the strategy behind you're doing what you do these days? Well, first of all, there's no hate involved. I mean, I welcome the industry to stay and remain the way it is. I mean, it's actually good because, you know, when I'm sitting talking with somebody like Anita Baker, we can point to the industry as the way we don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we don't believe in free goods and we don't believe in. Um, uh, you know, 90% of the contract, the way it's written now, the standard contract. We don't believe in 360 deals. Anybody that signs one of those are absolutely crazy. But it's a free country. You can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, the thinking behind this was to um, introduce a new artist to the world, somebody who is very dear to me, and her music, it, it's soothing. It soothes me. Um, I'm not a big fan of male vocalists, you know. Um, usually when I do uh, uh, ballads, I use my higher register mm -hmm. because I love the female voice doing slow music. Um, I spoke too soon and mistakenly compared uh, Bria's music to Sade's music. I didn't mean that she sounded like Sade, but I did mean that um, there's a romance that is presence in Sade's music mm -hmm. that, um, like the song, um, Love is Stronger Than Pride. It's mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful tunes ever. And there's a romance that was missing in today's music. And the best thing I could tell Bria was, try to do something that is not happening today. Try to get into a niche, because you have a beautiful voice, but you've got to do something with it that you don't hear. And that's what she's done. And it, it's one of those sleeper records that you know, if people play and listen to all the way through, she got you. Why am I not hearing a lot of this on radio? Uh, I think it's because I'm not signed with a major label. Um, Target is not a record company. They're a distributor and a retail store and a very good one at that. 30 million people go through their stores every week. So they get a chance to pick up the Lotus Flower record. Uh, the beautiful thing about the relationship is that they're treating us like any other record company. They buy the same amount and they pay the same price. So, you know, we've done quite well already. Um, Bria's taken care of, I'm taken care of. Um, I hope to do more deals like this with artists like Anita Baker and um, John Blackwell, Rhonda and Renato. We're trying to work on some jazz things right now. Yeah. but. Um, 
time will tell. It was pretty amazing to me, though, that without radio, it's just me talking, without radio airplay, with a sole, a singular distributor, you end up missing number one when this thing dropped by like, it's like Maxwell Smart. Missed it by that much. Yeah. That, that, that was pretty, that was, that was serious. Well, there again, you know, that's when the fighter in me comes out. And, right. you know, I, you know, think about Jack Johnson knocking somebody down three and four times yeah. and then they still say he lost the fight or something. You know, it's, uh, it, SoundScan said that it was number two. Mm -hmm. um, other charts say that it was number one. So it doesn't make a difference to me one way or another. What makes a difference to me is that history is told truthfully. And that's not always the case. Um, I love golf and uh, basketball and sport and boxing especially because it's, uh, it's mano a mano. Mm -hmm. And we hold our own at the box office. Uh, it would be wonderful if it was on the radio. It's shocking that it's not. There's stuff on there, all of Minneapolis Sound, you could put on the radio tomorrow. But uh, there's some resistance to it. Uh, you'll have to ask your friends at radio. The few I've asked haven't given me a straight answer yet, so I don't know. If you had a station or a string of stations that you were the program director of, owner and program director, what would it sound like? I would just want it to be good music, mm -hmm. and I'd want it to be littered with artists who own their master rights, because without that, they don't own any wealth. They can't put back into their community. It's very few artists that do own their masters right now. Uh, when that changes in the future, you'll see more radio stations being purchased. Uh, you'll see airwaves changing ownership rapidly. Because you obviously are, you told a Jimi Hendrix story earlier, and because obviously you are the greatest, one of the greatest guitarists of our time. Man, you, I like this show. No, what do you mean? Hey, I'm, look, I'm, look, oh. You know why? We, we just tell the truth around here. We just tell the truth. <laughs> I'm just trying to be a truth teller. Um, no, what, what, loving, do you make, what do you make person, of this? Thank you. Uh, thank you. What do you make of um, this guitar hero? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm mad at him. I hear it made like $2 billion, mm -hmm. and they came to us and offered us uh, a very small portion of that. But uh, I just think it's more important that kids learn how to actually play the guitar. It's, it's a tough instrument. It's not easy. Uh, it took me a long time, and it was frustrating at first. And you just have to stick with it. And um, it, it's cool for people who don't have time to learn the chords or ain't interested in it, but it, to play music is one of the greatest things. To create something from nothing is one of the greatest feelings. And I would, I don't know, I wish it upon everybody. It's heaven. Yeah. Yeah. She's one of the three records, Elixir. Uh, by Bria Valente in this new three CD package at lotusflower.com. Tell me how you found her. I'm going to talk to her in just a second, so you're going to give me the lead in here. Um, she says that she met me first, um, and um, that's what she told me. Uh, I say that I met her first. Uh, I will say this, that Morris Hayes is very instrumental. He's my keyboard player. He's very instrumental in us actually coming together. Mm. And once we got together, um, it was, we clicked. It was pretty easy. And uh, the most interesting thing about her is how rapidly she picked up understanding of scripture. Mm. Because I pretty much talk about that with everybody I know. Because it, uh, uh, informs my life so much now. Uh, the other thing is that uh, she's really funny and she likes to laugh. And you know, Travis, I love to laugh. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, <laughs> yeah, he's funny. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I'm kidding. I told yeah. her I was going to say that to you one yeah. time. <laughs> That was for her. You got it out. And on that note, you can get out of here. <laughs> His right. name is Prince. His new project is called Lotus Flower. It has not one, not two, but three CDs in it. Bria Valente, Elixir. Prince, of course, Lotus Flower. And Prince, Minneapolis Sound. It's all good stuff. Prince, I love you, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. Glad <laughs> to have you back, here. Brother. Appreciate it. Up next, singer Bria Valente. Stay with us.
Bria Valente is a talented singer featured on one of the three new discs from music icon Prince. Elixir is the first CD that kicks off this unique new set, which you can get at Prince's website, lotusflower.com. From the new project, here's some of the video for Every Time. So Bria leans over to me during the uh, <laughs> clip and says, we're just trying to make some stellar elevator music. <laughs> It's a whole lot better than that. Brian, look behind that curtain. Make sure Prince is gone. Make sure he's, is he gone? Good. All right. He's gone now. So tell me the truth. Uh, who, how did y'all really meet? He says he met you first. You said you met him. How did, how did, who, what, what really happened? Oh, well, um, I was 17. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I was working with Morris Hayes at the time. Mm -hmm. And he um, had brought me over to Paisley Park. And I waited for Morris, and he had met with Prince, and all of a sudden, um, 10 minutes later, he came down and just sat next to me and uh, didn't look at me. He just said, hello. And I said, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your name? And, and I, I said, I'm Bria. And he said, uh, nice to meet you. And that was it. And then he was gone and didn't talk to him since. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the first time we met. And then fast forward a few years later and you got a project Yes, to yes. I, I moved out to L.A. and uh, in a chance meeting, um, we ended up getting back together. So that was really cool. And Morris Hayes was, again, the... the conduit. Yes, the yeah. conduit for the um, collaboration. That's so. amazing. Mm -hmm. What's it like to be put there, to be exposed, to be introduced by Prince? It's a privilege and a blessing. Mm -hmm. and, and really the... The situation that we had in the working environment that I was in was like a family. And we all love music. I mean, I grew up with music. My father's a musician. Um, and coming from Minneapolis, too, I think there was a really special mm -hmm. connection there. And uh, when we all got together, we just combined our talents and then we made this record that we were all really proud of. And I. I never ever thought that I'd be working with Prince to tell you the truth. So I moved away from Minneapolis and I ended up coming right back home, basically. Mm, that's, that's a fascinating <laughs> so, story. So yeah. it's really interesting how that works. Tell me about your music. Tell me about Bria's music. I wanted a record from front to back that you can just play through and it just talks about the best qualities of love. Mm -hmm. And um and that's what this record really captures. So we did that, and, and uh, there's a lot of live instrumentation. A few songs are jam sessions mm -hmm. that we turned into um, songs after the fact, and, um, and it just it turned out beautiful. I'm so proud of it. Mm -hmm. Whenever Prince introduces us to somebody, there's always at least one song, maybe a couple, but always mm -hmm. at least one song that we all latch on to because it mm -hmm. has that quintessential Prince Mm -hmm. artist, Prince Protégé sound. Mm -hmm. uh, Mikey, one of my camera guys and I were talking earlier, we think the song that does that on your project is Tonight. Tonight, yeah. Would you agree with us? Yes. Mikey, she agrees. <laughs> uh, tell me why we think that has that quintessential Prince Protégé sound. Uh, well, Prince knows how to make people dance. He's, he's mm. funky. That's, that's, that's <laughs> so. a nice way to put it. He knows how to make us dance. He does. Yeah. He has that, that quality and, um, and I think that track is definitely something that that brings that out and you know some people have compared it to nasty girl mm -hmm. you know but uh but yeah i would say yeah that's yeah. how it all comes together to, to your to your word choice of comparing it said to nasty girl that word comparing prince obviously here just a few minutes ago uh made the point and said and i'm quoting him almost he says perhaps i spoke too soon mm. when i compared bria to to, mm -hmm. to Sade. And he explained what he meant by that. I don't have to repeat that part. People just saw that a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you make of the comparisons that others make between your music and whatever? Uh, well, actually, this record kind of has a, um, a sound of its own. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to compare to anything else. And, um, you know, everybody's going to take something from it based on their personal experience. So... Um, Nothing really bothers me as far as comparisons mm -hmm. are concerned. Um, but most people that hear it, you know, uh, my voice has a different tone than, than other people. I've, I've been compared, um, as I've heard, to Shantae Moore mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, some other artists um, like that. But, um, but it really does take on its own energy and it mm -hmm. has its own, own feeling in, in it. So Tell me about the challenge that Prince gave you 
to create your own sound, to create your own mm -hmm. lane, to do something that's not being done now. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he mentions that that's the challenge that he gave you if he was going to work with you. Tell me how you go about responding to that kind of a challenge. Well, um, that takes a lot of uh, uh, introspection. You, know, you mm -hmm. got to kind of sit with yourself and just think about what you want to hear that you're not hearing. You know what I mean? And there's certain things that really touch me in music, and it's when I hear heart and mm -hmm. when I hear genuineness and um, caring and things like that. That's um, that's something that really gets me. And music is such a powerful thing. It can capture a moment in your life and bring you back to that spot. Mm -hmm. So it connects with you on an emotional level, on a spiritual level. And so I, I really got in touch with, with myself in that fact of, of what is going to, what would I enjoy listening to? Mm -hmm. And so I, I tried to write about the things that would that I would like to hear about. Um, I love the positive message of love and 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 the organic uh, pureness of real music, you know. And and I just wanted to capture that. I just wanted to capture something very real that people could listen to, and um, and it would touch them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When did you know that? music was what, because you modeled and that's part of your backstory as well. Um, when did you know that music was what you wanted to do, not just something that you enjoyed? I think it was in school. When I started doing talent shows, that's kind of when I knew that this was something I want, this is what made me happy. Mm -hmm. And it really does make you happy when, when you make something from nothing. That is the biggest rewarding feeling that you can have. And, uh, and I really enjoyed that. So, you know, doing the talent shows and and writing music and learning things from my father. And he played 27 instruments. So he's like Prince. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm okay but, but does he also do lead vocals, background <laughs> vocals, engineering, mixing? Well, you know what? <laughs> exactly, that's yeah. the key. If you're going to launch a project, Bria knows how to, how to put it out there. We should all be so fortunate <laughs> to have Prince put yeah. us out there as part of a three-CD set. Uh, her name, Bria Valente, just learn it and get used to saying it because you're going to hear it for years to come. Bria Valente is the name. The CD is called Elixir, part of Prince's new three CD set at lotusflower.com. Bria, nice to have you on. Oh, it's a pleasure. First to be time, here. I hope it's not the last. I hope not. To. Nice to see you. <laughs> All right. That's our show for tonight. Catch me on the weekends on PRI, Public Radio International. You can access our radio podcast through our website at pbs.org. And I'll see you back here next time on PBS. Until then, good night from LA. Thanks for watching. And as always, keep the faith.